Welcome to our last panel of the day, um, continuing to be a very exciting uh, subject. Uh, and we're looking at one of the key issues uh, related to the events, unfolding events um, with the war, uh, and we are at war. Uh, Professor Stiglitz very clearly said that, and the second panel confirmed it. Uh, so we're looking at the question of energy, and we have two uh, of the foremost experts on these issues uh, in, in a broad and narrow sense of the word. Uh, Olivia Lazar, who is a uh, fellow with Carnegie Europe. Uh, she hails from France, has done many things in her life before uh, engaging in these issues in, in Africa and various places in the world. And we have Julian Popov, uh, based in London, right? Uh, who hails from Bulgaria, and he will explain to us the intricacies of the energy uh, situation. Um, we will then have a Q&A, and we'll finish sharply uh, just before uh, 1 o'clock. So, Olivia, uh, you have the floor. And from what I gather, you have a presentation. Uh, we shall. Follow. And by the way, Olivia Lazar was a Europe's Futures Fellow Indeed. last year with us at the Institute for Human Sciences. Okay. So um, you can't see, so. My job was made fairly easy by um, Professor Stiglitz's intervention this morning. I'd like to piggyback on a couple of things that you said. One is this notion of the war economy. The other one is the supply chain disruptions. About the war economy, we need to ask a key question, which is when the war ends. And by that, I mean, what is the end game for Russia? Does it stop with Ukraine or does it go beyond? Parts of what I'm about to present have to do with the future of energy in Europe and how we're, we have to contextualize the future of energy in Europe into a larger global context in terms of changing of paradynamics at the geopolitical and geoeconomic levels, and how we're headed into a time of ecological, climate, and energy disrup disruptions. The second thing having to do with supply chains is essentially the fact that, as Professor Stiglitz was saying, we currently have circumstantial supply chain disruptions. They're vastly associated to what is going on in China, to the fact that the pandemic is still heavily impacting the way in which China functions from an economic perspective, and the fact that China is indeed still the factory of the world. But I'll put another question to the floor here, which is essentially, what is the future of supply chains in a world where supply chains can actually be instrumentalized, manipulated, or even weaponized? and when that means something, essentially, for the future of energy in Europe. I'm going to run through a few of the challenges that we have to reckon with in Europe going forward, starting with two important historical moments. The first one was when President von der Leyen took office, and she gave one of her speeches, which was about the Green Deal, and the fact that the Green Deal was going to be the European man on the moon moment. I'm going to have to argue that in order to send people on the moon, you need some proper rockets and space vessels, and you need to actually have the machinery in place in order to build those rockets and vessels. We currently suffer from a lack of vision related to that. The second historical moment is related to earlier this year and the communication or the publication of the Repower EU Directive, which is essentially Europe's response to the reorganization of energy within Europe and abroad as a result of the war in Ukraine. There's been a lot of focus on gas and hydrogen, but this is the very first time, if you look closely within the actual uh, Repower EU strategy, that one, we have an international strategy, which 
did not exist with the Green Deal before. The Green Deal was made for Europeans, by Europeans originally, and it had never considered essentially the foreign dimension of energy, which is quite peculiar for a continent or for a region that is outsourcing a lot of energy and trying to import a lot of energy into its own territory to function as an economy. And the second peculiar thing about the Repower EU um, directive is the fact that for the very first time in our history, we started having some mention of critical raw materials as an international dimension of relations from the EU into the rest of the world, which is a very good sign. The part that is missing is essentially a whole lot of sequencing that needs to happen in order to source materials in a way which is conscious of all the challenges that we have to grapple with today. We have entered into the age of what I call wicked solutions. We have to go towards decarbonization because we have a climate crisis, but this has a lot of implications, which are going to bear heavily essentially on the ecological future of the planet, on the energy future of Europe, and on its place within the rest of international relations. Parts of the challenges that I want to run through go from basic physics to much larger issues of conflict and what in French we would tend to call conflictualité or different forms of conflict um, that affect the world. The very first thing that we need to know about Europe's direction in terms of energy is obviously that we have indeed the Green Deal with a climate law. The climate law asks us to reduce our greenhouse gases by 55% at least by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. And in order to do so, we need to heavily shift towards a re renewable energy mix. In order to do so, we need to find a lot more materials to obtain what we call the same amount of power density. What I mean by that is something very simple. One unit of coal, one unit of gas, one unit of oil produce that much more power density than one unit of solar energy contracted within a solar panel or within a windmill, or a wind turbine, sorry. What you see on this left-hand graph is essentially this representation. You have a high density of power and a low amount of space that you need in order to produce that power for fossils, and you have an extremely high need in terms of material intensity for all of the renewables. To give you but one example, in order to build an electric vehicle today, we need about six times as much materials and critical minerals as we do for a conventional car. And the entire energy system is going to be a lot more materially intensive going forward. So we're switching essentially from a fossil energy system into a mineral one. And what you see on the right-hand the, the right sides are the type of materials that we need. We're talking about rare earths, we're talking about cobalt, silver, lithium, graphite, tantalum. There is a whole list of a number of different materials that we need. It's not just that we need many, it's that we need many of them because we're creating a compound economy of different clean technologies. And the particularity of those materials is that they are not rare by nature. They have a very low concentration in the crust of the earth. In order to produce on average 10 grams of copper, you actually need to extract about one ton, one ton of soil. This produces this type of mine to produce that much amount of usable material. So we're essentially shifting into a so-called green economy, which will push us to dig very deep into the environment, to dig very far and wide in order to sustain energy intensive um, economies. Do we have the right production capacity to do this? Not quite. We know from market supply chains at the moment in terms of projections, that copper is about to run very low, that there's going to be an outstripping of demand compared to supply within the next five years. It's the same for a number of other types of supply chains regarding rare earths, lithium, graphite, cobalt, etc., etc. We know now, thanks to um, 
benchmark minerals, that we need to open up at least 336 new mines to meet our decarbonization demands by 2035. So not only is that going to have a very high impact in terms of ecology, but we have to ask ourselves, where will the mines open up? And in order to figure this out, we need to figure out where the deposits are. This is a map that the International Institute for Sustainable Development produced back in 2018. All of the green dots essentially represent the many different types of materials that we need to, the, to, that we need to build the decarbonized economy and energy system, their location, and their deposit size. This is a map which is not fully updated today. We're still discovering a number of deposits, but this is a map that gives you essentially a sense of where the various deposits are located in the world and how we're gonna go about creating a new type of energy system which is actually outsourced for the most part outside of Europe. We do have some deposits and some mining activities in Europe, but because of environmental concerns, because of legal standards regarding environmental, social, and governance standards, and because of environmental activisms, these mines are usually blocked from activity, which is something that we're gonna have to probably review. In the meantime, we need to look elsewhere. And we need to look at all the places where you find the concentration in South America, in different parts of Africa, and quite heavily concentrated in the Indo-Pacific and Central Asia, which means that the future of Europe in terms of energy is outside of its borders and depends on a foreign policy that actually accompanies the industrial and technological policy that we're trying to put into place which is why it was extremely important right from the beginning to try and create a foreign component to the Green Deal, which was missing and which we're starting to build only now. The problem is that this map demonstrates something really important to notice. Behind the green dots, you see shades of brown and red. They represent um, the rankings in terms of corruption indices and fragility indices that all of these countries um, sort of score on. A lot of countries that are actually very well endowed in uh, critical raw materials are also countries that tend to be fragile, that tend to have a high level of corruption and predation. So that means that doing business in those environments is particularly difficult, especially for companies that are stock market listed, which is usually the case for mining companies in the OECD space. The other thing which is complicated is indeed that we're facing essentially a potential for um, more inequalities in the way that business is done in those places. Because usually environments or countries that, that strong fairly high on corruption indices tend to strong very high as well on societal fragmentation, on marginalization, and on equality. Inequality, sorry. This is why it's also quite unfortunate that these countries tend to be highly climate vulnerable. Something that the IPCC identifies as one key aspect of global fragility going forward. The more unequal a society is, the more um, vulnerable it is going to be to climate impacts, and therefore the more it is going to widen global inequalities, not just national ones, but inequalities between the global north and the global south. The other problem with um, where the deposits are located it's quite simply that these countries actually host the most critical ecosystems that we need to regenerate and to protect in order to stabilize the global climate regime, the hydrological cycle, and in order to protect biodiversity. So we actually have a conflict and a tension between the decarbonization agenda and between the regen regeneration agenda, which is also strongly linked to the adaptation agenda. So there are structural issues at play here, which first and foremost concern the planet. We need to care for a planet that we're overshooting boundaries for. This is one thing. The other thing which is concerning is that we are now in, an, in a global environment where fragility, 
can be instrumentalized as a means to pursue a renegotiation of the global balance of power. And this is where a larger and more complex picture regarding the role of Russia and China comes in and why we need to sort of look at this balance of power and in terms of what it means for the future of Europe going forward. Usually people tend to talk in terms of supply chains directly about China. I'll come to China in a minute. But I'd like to start with the role that Russia is playing. If you look at this map, this is a map of Ukraine, and it's a map of the deposits for rare earths only. Ukraine has a lot more different things. It has lithium, it has hydrocarbons, it has uranium, it has a ton of other types of critical minerals outside of rare earths. But rare earths are really important because the European Union is 98% dependent on China for rare earths for the provision of rare earths for all of its industrial and clean tech ecosystem. And it is quite peculiar that in July 2021, the European Union struck a strategic partnership with Ukraine in order to diversify supply chains for rare earths and other types of critical minerals, and in order to try and bring Ukraine within the European path towards an energy transition, by creating an industrial pact. It was in July 2021. Most of the deposits are located in the eastern part of the country. A few months later, we have the invasion that started. And for now, we're seeing a tactical play where Ukraine is thankfully regaining a lot of its territory. But Russia was aiming and still aims for access to these different materials. Why do I, keep, do I uphold this theory? Well, it's because Ukraine is not the only case in town. Back in 2018, I was in the Central African Republic. Back in 2018 was the year when the Wagner Group was introduced in the Central African Republic to try and help with the stabilization of the country, something which was very odd for a lot of people like me who were working in political mediation and stabilization. We saw the Wagner Group arrive, arrive in Bangui, and then we saw it being dispatched in a country where 80% of the territory is controlled by armed groups and where it's inaccessible to the Central African state. If you look at this slide, on the left-hand side, you have a map of the various deposits. The blue dots are actually gold and diamonds. Please don't take care of so much of the blue dots, except for the fact that you see that they're located in the same place as the gray dots. The gray dots represent the many other minerals that we need to decarbonize. And the reason why I chose the Central to talk about the Central African Republic today is because this country is usually not associated to the energy transition. It's usually not represented in maps for deposits, but having been there myself, I know that it's a country that has a lot of rare earths, a lot of silver, a lot of copper, a lot of cobalt, and a lot of other stuff that we need. And interestingly, when you look at the right-hand side of the slide, the orange dot locate the presence of the Wagner Group, whereas the gray dots locate the size of civilian casualties. There is a correlation between the Wagner presence and the mineral extraction potential. The Wagner Group is not currently extracting those minerals. They are testing the grounds. They are exploring. We know from having talked with a number of Central Africans in the country, outside of the capital, that a number of planes come in and out very often and take away a lot of minerals with them to try and sample, because this is how mining exploration works. And if it were just Ukraine and the Central African Republic, we could consider that Russia is an odd player within the energy transition, but it's not. I was in Madagascar also this summer to try and explore essentially what is happening with the number of mines that are being exploited for the energy transition. Lo and behold, Stork and Fair Mining, two companies that are associated to the Wagner Group, acquired a chromite mine. Chromite is used for solar panels. 
chromite that they actually acquired at a very low production price, and the benefits were increased or doubled because they were selling their um, production to China. And the reason or the way in which they acquired the chromite mine is actually by supporting the current Malagasy president in his electoral campaign. So just with those three examples, with Ukraine, we have a case of outright aggression to try and gain access to a number of different minerals or hydrocarbons or uranium deposits that Europe and other regions of the world are going to need for their collective transition. In the Central African Republic, we see the deployment of a number of mercenaries to try and gain access to those deposits, not currently being exploited, but keeping them very warm until the moment when it's needed. And then in Madagascar, we have a case essentially of political usurpation and manipulation of socioeconomic underdevelopment, as well as fragility to serve industrial, geoeconomic, and industrial purposes. The means of which actually serve a larger end goal, which is for Russia to ride the wave that China has created in terms of turning supply chain concentration to their own advantage. China, as Professor Stiglitz was saying this morning, has been, has been the world's factory for over 20 years. If I were not concerned with the way that China is turning that to their advantage, I would be in complete awe at how they turned the table around in terms of how to acquire the means, essentially, of controlling a lot of economic um, outposts in the way that the global you know, sort of economy functions. But there is a danger in how China is actually managing to turn the energy transition into a process of changing the world's global balance of power and acquiring the means to establish a new sense of economic hegemony according to their own terms. I've already mentioned that the European Union is 98% dependent on China for rare earths, but the European Union and the rest of the world is also fundamentally dependent on China for the processing of lithium, cobalt, tantalum, and other types of products. Which means that while Europe has been busy, busy trying to focus essentially on curating a homegrown clean tech innovation hub by trying to push on standards, by trying to push on clean tech innovation, but completely forgetting that clean tech actually depends on functional mining and industrial supply chains, we find ourselves at the mercy, potentially, of supply chain weaponization, which has quite a lot of implications because we are, by now, because of our climate law, or thanks to our climate law, accountable to the younger generations, but also to a social pact where we have no choice but to deliver by 2030 on greenhouse gas reduction targets. And this is obviously very much needed because the planet depends on it. But at the moment, what Europe has been missing is that while it was busy focusing on the financial technical issues of the transition, it completely blindsided itself by not looking at the reality that a geopolitical play is playing as part of the transition, and that this geopolitical play requires a foreign and defense policy. It requires another type of intelligence going forward. And it requires a very agile, a very nimble type of relationship curation with the countries that are not just well endowed in the resources that we need, they are also on the front line of climate change and ecological collapse, and they are on the front line of the manipulation and instrumentalization of fragility. All of these different aspects now come together in terms of letting us know or giving us a sense of where Europe can be headed. We should not just look at the technical foundations of the transition. We should fundamentally rethink the way in which we interact with neighbors and with countries in Latin America, Africa, and in the Indo-Pacific, 
We should try and understand the type of transition models and business models that China, Russia, and other countries are using to create very unhealthy dependencies with those countries. And what that means in terms of the type of instruments, the type of investments, the type of political relationships that Europe will be able to engage in with the future, in the future with those countries. And it, I'll just finish there. The uh, reality is that Europe is going to have to change its mindset about the notion of how climate change is playing out. I engage quite a lot with a number of climate ambassadors on a very specific topic, which is usually called climate security. And climate security for the past 15 years has been associated to, oh, those climate impacts playing out in Somalia, in Afghanistan, in all those different places were not the same. We're not the same. We're solid, we're resilient, and we're going to have the means to cope whatever happens. The reality is that for the moment, Europe doesn't have the means of its ambitions, and that climate impacts are starting to hit extremely hard. So we're going to have to bring home the concept of climate security to understand essentially that this notion of security and international stability now concerns us. It plays out on many different aspects. It plays, out, it plays out in industrial policy. It plays out on political issues regarding the use of disinformation, for example, to fragment Europe from a political perspective within Europe and outside of Europe. It plays out in terms of usurpation of political systems and accountability. It plays out in terms of um, using fragility, corruption, and predation to the advantage of those who want to upset the current balance of power. And that means essentially that two of our principal aims in Europe should be to try and make sure that we do acquire the means of our ambitions, including starting to mine again in Europe, where it is possible and where it ecologically makes sense, and trying to also look towards the countries that we should be heavily invested into, not just from an industrial perspective, but from an adaptation perspective. And this is a new proposition that Europe should go about developing today, because the name of the game has changed from just mitigation to adaptation, and we need to have a different type of diplomatic and security proposition going forward. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Olivia. Uh, huge uh, challenges ahead and uh, revealing uh, what many people are not aware of, and, and that is the, the dependencies that, that you have talked about. But uh, I give the floor to Yuram Popov, who will now give his presentation, and after that we will do a Q&A. Yuram. Thank you. Uh, do I have to press something here? No, you're no, okay. Everything's okay. Um, thank you. I'm the last speaker. Everything has been said already. So um, I'll just add here and there a few things. Uh, regarding the last presentation, uh, if you want to chase an interesting story, uh, look who is the climate change uh, ambassador and advisor of Vladimir Putin. It's Ruslana Dodgirov, uh, who... Uh, used to be the right-hand man of Kadyrov, and he was prime minister of Chechnya. He doesn't know anything about climate change, but he is kind of young and very uh, um, uh, ambitious. And before the war, he was the, the counterpart of John Kerry <laughs> on the Russian side. <laughs> um, so if you want to dig there, there is a lot of digging. And of course, the other thing is Wagner and uh, what Olivia was saying about all the relationship with uh, mining and corruption. And, and do help a little bit in comparing the EU-Africa summit with the EU-Russia summit. Just go on the website of the two to see that the EU-Russia summit is much, much better organized, much more focused on uh, oil, gas, extractive um, industries, and corruption. 
and uh, EU Russia summit is entirely based on memorandums of understanding and nothing else. Um, so the question of uh, EU foreign policy related to all these issues, including energy diplomacy, which is sort of my space. I was even energy ambassador at some point. Um, is, uh, is, a, is a great gap in the European Union, which is a genetic gap, because the European Union was set up not as an internationally looking body, but as an inward looking body. And if we look at the uh, declaration, Schuman Declaration, which uh, sort of set up um, uh, the European Union, or started uh, what we call now European Union, um, it, it is all about avoiding war inside, but not about outside. Uh, an interesting uh, fact from this declaration is that there are three geographies mentioned there. One is Germany, the other is France, and the third is Africa. Africa is totally forgotten, and EU doesn't have um, any foreign, I mean, it has foreign, uh, something like foreign minister, but doesn't have any foreign policy, and that's a major, major problem now. Uh, so back to the energy crisis, I said that everything has been said. Um, uh, I would especially thank uh, Professor Stiglitz and Professor Bush uh, for, uh, Professor Stiglitz for the uh, introducing and emphasizing the issue of war economy. I've been advocating that for the last six months uh, with incredible frustration and uh, on all levels in the European uh, Union. Uh, and, uh, but also what Professor Bush was saying that, well, don't worry. I mean, things are okay. So do we have an energy crisis? Yes, we have energy crisis. Should we worry about that? Yes, we should worry. Like in any crisis, we should react on that. But there is a big difference between crisis, serious crisis, severe crisis, disaster, and tragedy. And uh, when media deals with these uh, realities, they start from the, uh, not from the crisis, but from the tragedy. They first ask, is there a tragedy? Uh, if there is no tragedy, can we invent it? If the reality is opposing that, then they go to disaster. And if that doesn't work, then they move to crisis and say, well, I mean, it's a very, very serious crisis. And that's how we generate all the stories about blackouts and, and so on. Not that blackouts are something very, very... Um, uh, it's not a tragedy. I mean, in the 90s, I, I lived through blackouts in Bulgaria uh, every two hours that uh, electricity was stopped. But blackouts are usually system issues. They are not so much that there is no electricity. There is electricity, but the markets and the system doesn't work very well. You have to control it in that way. Now the control of the electricity system is much better. Uh, there is plenty of energy around. Uh, we have to reorganize all that uh, energy. But what is the nature of the crisis? So uh, we, we focus very much on the war in Ukraine and said, well, the war in Ukraine produced the energy crisis. Well, there, there, there are several other things. So first, of course, the COVID crisis came. Uh, the COVID crisis, if we you think about that, took out of the economy billions and billions and billions of working days. Just took them out, uh, disappeared. People are staying in home, being paid, in the Western world, so-called at least, and, uh, and they were not working. And then the, the lockdowns finished, and everybody who wanted to stay at home rather than going to work was saying, I don't feel well, so I'm not coming to work. So, more and more working days have been disappearing. But this is a very, very strange economic crisis. I mean, I, I, I find it very uh, kind of embarrassing in front of uh, Professor Stiglitz to talk about economy, but uh, um, it, it's not a crisis that is um, uh, kind of triggered by uh, deep economic processes. It's just suddenly the economy was externally stopped, and it had this kind of elastic element in it that the uh, 
energy of the economy was being contained, and at some point when the lockdown finished, this containment was released, and the economy jumped up <laughs> uh, all over the world. And all the things that had to be done during COVID, and people were not doing them, they didn't disappear, they were just postponed. I mean, imagine this, uh, uh, I don't know, let's say Europe has 500 million citizens, and if they're all good citizens, they uh, would go once a year to a dentist. And imagine that for one year, 500 million people don't go to a dentist, and the next year, there will be one billion going to the dentist rather than 500 million. So obviously, the the system of dentists is collapsing, and it is collapsing. And it's the same with energy, it's the same with many other things. The supply chain was severely damaged, and uh, maintenance work, uh, things that had to be done anyway, had to be had of, um, done later. And, and now we have this, uh, there, there are no people. I mean, there's nobody to work. There's no unemployment in the Western world. Um, so uh, all these mechanisms of, of the economy are somehow working in a very kind of odd way. At the same time, during COVID, there was a massive um, savings. I mean, somewhere in the middle of the lockdown, the uh, UK had generated 125 billion pounds additional savings. And people wanted to spend them, <laughs> so they started spending them. So this kind of fuel suddenly spending uh, uh, naturally led to higher energy demand, higher energy demand, but with disrupted supply chains. So then the, the, the price of gas started gr growing. And here, I mean, I'm sure you're all journalists, at least 10% of you are conspiracy theorists, otherwise you will, um, I mean, that, that, that's part of the job sometimes. Um, one wonders whether there was sort of not some bright criminal minds around Putin who is saying, well, there is a crisis and we can kind of push into the crisis and sort of let's exacerbate it. And, and that's what happened last year uh, when Europe started moving out of the crisis, uh, Russia started reducing its gas supplies. They were still honoring their uh, contracts, but when Europe needed more gas, that gas was not supplied. And then, and then the prices started going up. And uh, that was a major uh, sort of act of market manipulation, which a normal uh, trade partner would not do. I mean, you have a contract, but if you need more than the contract and, the, and your uh, partner has the supply, will supply this. I mean, that's the normal kind of trade relations. Russia was not doing that. They were, they were withholding. And the International Energy Agency in January, with quite a delay, uh, warned that basically Putin is withholding gas supplies and manipulating the market. The problem with Europe is that uh, that was the moment, so about a year ago, when Europe had to have a, this wartime strategy, not for gas, I would say for uh, um, resource resilience, any resources, any energy resources, anything to do with electricity, gas, coal, oil, wood, everything, and, and think what we should do if we have a, if this crisis become from a normal crisis, start becoming serious crisis and moving to a severe crisis, which were somewhere there. And no disaster, no tragedy, but we're somewhere between serious crisis and severe crisis of energy. But Europe was not doing that and refusing to develop this sort of a normal kind of a wartime demand reaction. And it is exactly that what Europe had to do. I mean, in war, you reduce demand because there is no enough 
supply. Not only there is no enough supply, but something will be blown up. And, and you don't know what exactly. So you have to be prepared to shrink supply uh, demand in a, in a much more managed, better managed way. But when you say, when a politician say, well, we have to reduce the temperature by one degree, and the entire Europe is up in arms. When um, the European Commission introduced the um, restrictions on the old uh, light bulbs, I mean, that was a revolution. That was a revolution when they introduced the um, uh, standards for, for vacuum cleaners. Because vacuum cleaners, there was even a, a, a story of a vacuum cleaner company that, uh, one of the famous companies, that were making vacuum cleaners a little bit noisier because that makes them sound more powerful. <laughs> and, the, and the headline, um, power of a vacuum cleaner does not translate in any way in, into it, uh, its um, efficiency. So when the European Commission said you will not use vacuum cleaners, which are 1,600 uh, watts, but we re you reduce it to 900, I mean, that was a, almost a revolution in the European Union. And nobody thought that actually 900 could work much better than 1,600 if it's properly designed. And that's what happened. I mean, the vacuum cleaner companies just moved there. And now vacuum cleaners are better and they, they save much more uh, energy. So these are the type of things that voters hate being told what to do with their vacuum cleaners, with their light bulbs and so on. But this is in a wartime situation, you have to say. I mean, we have to, we have to manage all that. We made calculations and I, I chair the main think tank in uh, Brussels that is dealing with energy demand. So I'm a little bit kind of obsessed with that uh, subject. But uh, we managed some calculations about what, in March, what can be done. So for example, loft insulation. Loft insulation is something that is very easy. I mean, any of you can go to the shop, buy the kind of special insulation wool, go to the loft and put it there and that's it. It's very easy. It can save 14% of the uh, uh, of the heat demand, and and the energy demand is very much heat uh, energy crisis is very much heat crisis. It's not so much electricity crisis. You know. uh, but nobody said, well, go and do something about your lots. Uh, there is a big story in the in UK about condensing boilers. I mean, I'm sorry that I'm talking about the most boring things on earth, but basically, you, all condensing boilers, which are the new efficient boilers, uh, and the whole UK is covered with them, are uh, tuned at high temperature of 75 degrees so that they, they produce good uh, heat. But when your boiler is 75 degrees, it doesn't condense. So it has to be under 65. When it's under 65, then it's much more efficient with exactly the same um, effect. And nobody knows that. And nobody would say, I mean, list trusts would come and say, it is a supply thing. We have to find the supplies. It's not about the supplies, stupid. It's about the demand. It's about managing the demand. And managing the demand, you can match the crisis of the supply by managing the demand. And this is, not, uh, this is not happening. And of course, the other thing that is not happening, and it is a, a major issue, is, uh, and Professor Stiglitz was mentioning that, about the uh, pushing of the, and, and the installation of the renewable energy. I mean, here I will say a few words about the renewable energy, because uh, you, will say, you will hear many people saying, Two things. One, the green, it's the Greens' fault, the whole thing. And the other one is, no, no, the green, thing, the green stuff is wonderful, but we have to postpone it a little bit because there is a crisis now. Both uh, statements are complete crap. I mean, they are um, factual, factually wrong. I mean, I'm taking my sort of a climate... Uh, um, identity and belonging completely out of this. And, and let's talk just about the facts, I mean, about the data. Uh, uh, this year, solar energy in the summer, 
solar energy in Europe uh, saved 20 billion cubic meters of gas and 29 billion uh, euros of money that we would have paid to uh, to, to Russia or, or to some other uh, democratic country like that uh, to get the gas in. So uh, the problem is not that there is green energy. There is not enough green energy or the uh, transition is not managed properly and with clear understanding. And the transition is not managed properly because there is a deep misunderstanding and wrong understanding about the energy and the energy economics. People who are working in governments and manage national <coughs> strategies, they, uh, they're educated people, but they're educated in a different world. The energy economics in the last 10 years, five years even, but let's say 10 years, um, and certainly all the people who manage the strategies and run countries have been educated longer than 10 years ago. In the last 10 years, the energy economics was turned up down, upside down. Everything that was expensive became cheap, and everything that was cheap became expensive. I mean, the renewables, I remember when we were in the COP15 uh, in, in Copenhagen, um, and then the, the, the main debate was renewables are very, very expensive, but we must have them because of climate. Uh, that's totally invalid now because we, <laughs> renewables are just the cheapest ones. The cheapest energy comes from renewable energy. So uh, at the same time, coal became expensive. Uh, nuclear used to be very cheap. Nuclear became the most expensive energy. And my guess is that after the Ukrainian war, uh, nuclear will become much more expensive because the reason nuclear is expensive is because it has a lot of security um, protocols that have to be followed. I mean, think about it. The biggest nuclear power station have been bombed and attacked by, um, by a large group of uh, gangsters who are threatening the world with nuclear attacks, and they're bombing the, um, uh, the biggest nuclear power station in Europe. So what do you think will happen as a result of that? I mean, every single citizen group, energy group, will start insisting on additional security measures, additional safety measures of, of nuclear power. That will put a uh, cost of nuclear power, I guess, with 25% up maybe more. I mean, after Fukushima, it went 70, 80% under. So renewable energy will become prohibitively expensive. Even though I'm a supporter of nuclear energy, but it, it's just very expensive. Coal became very expensive because of environmental uh, constraints and, 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 and also the, uh, the carbon markets. Uh, but we can't suspend that. I mean, the idea that we will suspend carbon markets is, is kind of a, just a, no, no starter. And, and also the carbon price contributes very, very, very little to, to the cost of, of energy at the moment. Uh, at the same time, it's not just this shifting between the very cheap becoming expensive and the very expensive becoming cheap, but also the way energy is, is kind of distributed. Energy used to be a very centralized commodity. I mean, you have a power station that has, has is, I don't know, one gigawatt, two gigawatts, and it produces electricity and sends it from one center to everybody. So everything that was centralized now is becoming highly decentralized. So it, it requires, really, it requires different market. Uh, but the, the different market should come very much because of that kind of decentralization is one thing. At the same time, things that were centralized, uh, decentralized before, started becoming not exactly centralized, but coordinated, like a sort of artificial intelligence coordinated. Uh, I don't like very much the idea of artificial intelligence, but that. So, for instance, even in the darkest time of communism, 
it was up to you when you will turn your light up or, or on or off. In modern world, you are in a connected system in which your lights start turning on and off because of, I don't know, some kind of a network that covers your house, covers your, your entire country. And this is the concept of demand site management, which is very, very important. And that is also part of the, uh, of the uh, solving the whole problem. So when we discuss the, the market design and market, because there is a lot of discussion on market design, at the moment, the, the, the debate is very much focused on uh, let's not allow people to uh, make excessive profits, companies to make excessive profits. And they do make excessive profits. Um, the question for me is whether we can find mechanisms in the existing market system that can control that and, and regulate that, or we have to fundamentally change the market. And I personally would prefer to see the existing markets being regulated a little bit better and, uh, and also to explore all the mechanisms in the existing markets. For instance, that, that started from, from UK mostly, but the contracts for difference. I mean, the contracts for difference are a fantastic mechanism which fixes the price of energy for the future for a long time. And then you have this contract, and if, uh, if the market is very weak, the government or the society or, or the fund for energy security or something else pays you the difference between the low market price and what you have agreed. So you have this predictability and the company is helped by some uh, public fund. But what happened now, all the companies that are on contracts for difference, they're printing money for the government. So state companies uh, print money for the government, but also companies with fixed, fixed longer term prices uh, produce massive amount of, of money which are um, helping to compensate the, the, the system. So I think this is, this is the area to look at how to, to sort of fix that um, side uh, of the market. And this is just a comment on what, what we were uh, discussing um, uh, earlier. And uh, the last thing that I will uh, say again on the market, uh, on how to deal with the excessive profits. Um, yes, we can impose windfall tax, for instance. I mean, that has been done by Tony Blair and many, but it's kind of a quite extreme case. Uh, I would wonder whether um, tax incentives for um, investing excessive profits into energy efficiency and renewable energy would not be the better way because then you don't uh, dis disrupt and, and redesign the whole market, but you use existing mechanisms. And I'd be very interested to hear um, opinions of people who uh, know a little bit, uh, not a little bit, much more about economics than I do, and those political co economics and taxes. So to uh, summarize everything that, that I was saying and my views is that um, this is to a large extent a self-inflicted crisis. It is self-inflicted because of political uh, uh, laziness and complacency, of not thinking about obvious risks. You can't become totally dependent or very highly dependent on, on Russia for, for anything. I mean, look at Turkey. I mean, Turkey was dependent, and then they said, well, we don't want to be dependent, and now Turkey tripled their gas import uh, capacity. And if Russia stops their gas, they have two times more capacity to import gas from all sorts of other places, including they have enough LNG terminals to supply the whole of Southeast Europe through them. 
uh, but the European Union and European countries have been very, very complacent, very lazy, very um, a kind of, uh, there is this term about the youngsters that they're sl snowflake generation. I think Europe is a uh, snowflake uh, continent and that must change and we have to face that reality. And whether we call it a war or whatever we call it, we have to, to, to think in a much more uh, sort of risk reduction um, uh, uh, approach and, and mind. So thank you. I hope it was thank good. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Julian, um, on that snowflake uh, metaphor. Um, we have uh, very little time, so I'll take one round of questions. Uh, so we'll start there, then Joseph Stieglitz, and then back there. Yeah. Well, um, I'm from EDM Institute for the Danny Bridge in Central Europe, Grauchenberg. Um, I have a question to Mrs. Lazar. Uh, it's concerning, uh, uh, you said, uh, of course, which is perfectly right, it, it's a problem that Europe did not look at the supply side for rare earths, etc. Uh, however, we have also the legal objections in nearly all of the European countries. It takes 10 years to have a tension line. Uh, a rare species uh, can stop any project. So how do you see that it is realistic at all that these uh, plans of the EU may, <laughs> may come on stream? Uh, we also have an example in Austria for rare uh, earth lithium, which is the, the biggest source uh, of Europe in Carinthia. It was sold a few years ago for one euro to an Australian company with, I think, some Chinese influence. <laughs> and uh, you still can block all these projects because of, of uh, legal objections. It takes endless time. Thank you. OK, Joe. Yeah. Uh, thank you both uh, for very interesting uh, presentations. Um, I, I have three questions for Olivia. For, the first is, um, the U.S. Uh, is trying to break relations uh, with China. I mean, there's a new Cold War. And your f figures about our de uh, the world's dependence on Chinese uh, rare or, or everything uh, were v very startling. Uh, if China and the U.S. really did break off relations, uh, how uh, terrible would it be? Would, would it be a crisis? Uh, how quickly are we able to develop alternative uh, sources? And, and as you pointed out, processing uh, capabilities, because you distinguish between that. It's very interesting. Um, the second thing is, uh, you described uh, how we are very dependent on all these minerals. If uh, we had fully priced the social cost of these minerals and maybe even corruption mm -hmm. and the risk, would we have the capacity of developing renewable energy sources that were not so dependent on outside? So for instance, I mean, yes, uh, these are better windmills than we might have if we didn't use the rare, the, mm. these other, but could we get along with, uh, May, maybe more synthetic materials that were not so dependent. Uh, so, uh, you know, had we provided the right incentives, would we have a different uh, dependency in our, uh, renew uh, in our whole renewable system uh, on these? And the third uh, question is, um, given that we've fallen so far behind in control of the natural resources that that uh, 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 China has gotten and other and Russia have gotten control of so much. Uh, to what extent, and often through Western subsidiaries, to what extent do investment agreements that uh, make it difficult for those to be abrogated and uh, for them to be reorganized? In other words, uh, if China, if Russia bought these uh, resources through a Netherlands subsidiary that has an investment agreement with Congo. Uh, 
DRC, mm -hmm. uh, you can't abrogate it without being sued. Mm -hmm. So have we gotten ourselves with our international agreements into a tangle? Mm -hmm. And then, Julian, I, I had uh, uh, two questions or comments. Uh, the first is, I agree very much that it's the structure of demand, not the aggregate demand, including the structure of demand uh, in uh, energy, and that we could have done a lot, we could do a lot through regulations to quickly reduce uh, energy demand. Um, but the overall picture on inflation that you described, we've looked at, I, don't, I haven't looked at it for Europe, but for the United States, it's very clear that we do not have an aggregate demand problem. That in fact, aggregate demand in the United States is below trend before the trend that existed before 2019. That yes, there were huge reserves that were built up, but economic theory and the empirical evidence shows that they are not being spent down. Be for an obvious reason, that people were gonna spread it over their lives and they face enormous amount of uncertainty. And that has led them to uh, high levels of precautionary balances. So while it was right for us to be worried that that might happen, it hasn't happened. And the current inflation has nothing or almost nothing to do with this uh, aggregate demand. And that's a, the reason why I emphasize the big source of controversy in the United States with Larry Summers arguing that, uh, and Republicans arguing that it was excessive spending in the pandemic that led to the current crisis. They're totally wrong. Uh, and uh, so, you, you know, in a way, what you were saying weighed into that particular debate, and I wanted to just make sure that, you know, and th that, that particular interpretation uh, of what's happened uh, is not uh, correct. Um, finally, I, I, um, I think that the reforms that need to be done to the European uh, energy system are more fundamental. Uh, as I mentioned, I think I, in my talk, I, uh, California tried deregulation of the form that Europe had, and it was a disaster. And Europe should have learned from that mistake. And that the volatility, the, the, uh, the windfall profits taxes, profits are, allow for the deduction of investment and uh, capital and labor, and our uh, windfall profits taxes are not distortionary. It is a good idea to provide incentives, both penalties and carrots and sticks, for doing more resilient, more uh, a greener uh, energy investment. But uh, the windfall profits taxes, particularly, I mean, as a, Example of the traders, the speculators who are making huge windfall profits taxes, uh, why should that not be taxed? Uh, and, uh, you know, they didn't do anything really uh, to deserve their huge uh, profits. And it's not only in energy, it's in food, it's in, in, in other areas. Uh, and, you know, this is wartime, and, and in wartime you execute people who are wartime profiteering. <laughs> I'm not calling for the execution. <laughs> of these people, uh, but I do think a, 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 war, a wartime profits tax uh, would be, and a more fundamental reform of the energy system would be called for. And finally, back there. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Peter Majidi, journalist from Hungary, Budapest. I would like to ask Mr. Popo about uh, the five new ideas from the European Commission, how to react for, on the high energy prices from the wind tax until the cap ideas. Is any of them could be useful? Uh, and if you have favorite out of them, which would be? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Back to our panel and Olivia first. I'm gonna um, take your questions in a bundle because they actually go together. Um, if you look at the way the European Commission is reacting to the current um, energy crisis and supply crisis, there is a new sort of mantra in Brussels, which is permit, 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 permit. And it's permit to install 
end use infrastructure in terms of the wind turbines and solar farms, which is already quite a problem. Well, it, it raises a lot of issues, and that's where there is a rush essentially towards offshoring a lot of the infrastructure in the Mediterranean and the North Sea and potentially in the Atlantic. Um, but there is also this general sort of impetus to say, well, we do need to mine more. <laughs> We do need more mines, so we're going to have to procure them some, some way or another. But then comes a question which you raised. Australia, for example, acquired a lithium mine in Austria. So I'm currently involved in a study where I'm looking at the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Kazakhstan, Brazil, Myanmar, uh, and Madagascar, and a number of other countries. I see a lot of Chinese companies. I see a few Russian companies. I see Glencore, Australian American, or Anglo American, sorry. I see Rio Tinto, but I don't see a lot of so called homegrown European companies of the Eremet style, for example. So where are they? There, there, there are two different things to think about here. One relates to what Professor Stiglitz was saying this morning. There is a part where we've come to a crunch in the, glo in the global economy, specifically for Europe, that doesn't work in terms of ideology. The market ideology is not serving the purpose of the transition. So Professor Stiglitz, you were saying it in terms of you know, like the energy crisis per se, but I'm looking at it from the supply, the supply side perspective, where if you look at what is happening in China, you have state-owned enterprises, which not only do they have many, but when it comes, for example, to rare earth mining and rare earth processing, they're now creating a merged giga factory or giga mining actor, a compound of six different mining companies, which they can deploy wherever they want to because they have this notion that industrial policy, energy policy, climate policy is foreign, foreign and defense policy. So, you're going to find, for example, that in the DRC, 50, 15 out of 17 different mines, cobalt mines, are owned by Chinese companies. The other two are Glencore. You can reproduce that in Chile, for example, where they're extremely active in lithium mining. You can reproduce that in the US, where they've actually acquired some processing plants. You can reproduce that in Canada, where we've just learned about two months ago that the Canadian government actually allowed for Chinese companies to acquire mining and operating assets in Canada. They have a way of playing by the rules of the game and turning them to their advantage. In Europe, we have not understood that. That's one. The second part is, if we have some companies that still operate according to a business model which is essentially just market-oriented and not geopolitical, geopolitical <laughs> and potentially wartime but also transition-oriented and therefore trying to help in terms of de-risking investments for mining you know, operations, but also trying to sort of help in terms of the price fluctuations, because this is also something that China is playing on. I'll give you just one example. When Indonesia is thinking about raising quotas in terms of nickel provision and supply chains, usually China is behind this. What the effect it has is essentially to raise the price of nickel in the clean tech environment and ecosystems, including in Europe, it raises the prices, it dampens the competition. Or for that matter, when you have China trying to acquire mining assets and try to over flood markets so that the prices fall. Because the result is essentially going to be that a number of OECD related companies are gonna look at copper fluctuation in terms of prices and say, well, maybe not worth the investment. Maybe not now, maybe later. So we're finding ourselves in a complete competitive void here and a complete schizophrenia, as you were saying, you know, there is a strategic sequencing which is not happening in Europe where if you want to invest in clean tech, for God's sake, try to look at the industrial part in the first place and try to look at how you can sustain your economy in the clean tech world, not just in terms of competition and innovation, but in terms of how supply chains, geopolitics and geoeconomics are changing. The last point that I will make is Yes, it takes time to look at the biodiversity components, the natural landscapes. This is important. Because at the end of the day, I, I come from a background where ecology matters. 
we have no choice but to sustain and to nurture and to regenerate natural landscapes. Our lifeline depends on it. If we go into a new industrial expansion era, at the expense of planetary boundaries, decarbonization is going to be the end of us. As much as it needs to happen, we need to decarbonize fast, but we need to decarbonize well. And that's what makes a difference for potentially European companies or so-called OECD companies, where there are some standards that need to be respected. But these standards need to be accompanied by government backing and de-risking and ability essentially to organize a supply ecosystems accompanying the clean tech ecosystem. In terms of the decoupling question, so this is one of the questions that keeps me up at night. Um, because technically to open up a mine and to have it operate properly, you need between seven and 15 years, depending on the actual sort of location on the mine, on the type of material, the concentration, the quality of the ore, and the sort of supply chain rationalization. So you, the US wanting to decouple, well technically in the US you have a lot more minerals relatively compared to Europe. So there is a potential rationale and the Inflation Reduction Act is essentially trying to sort of leapfrog into the industrial phase and to try and accelerate by creating um, business incentives to, really, to push essentially industrial operatives to move into that space of clean energy and clean tech. The issue, once again, here is that a lot of the deposits are usually located in either fairly densely populated areas or in indigenous lands. This is also quite something quite specific for the US, so there's going to be a lot of domestic um, reticence in that direction of a different kind compared to Europe, but the result of this is the same. So how quickly are we going to be able to reconstruct essentially an industrial ecosystem? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, uh, first of all, because it depends on one, democratic conversations that need to happen. Climate activists and environmental activists need to understand that decarbonization is industrial policy. And industrial policy is reorganization of uh, monetary policy, of debt policy, of uh, territorial policy for that matter. That conversation is not taking place in Europe. I'm not seeing a lot of it in terms of there are some opportunity costs to shifting energy systems. We have to take them, but they have to be accompanied, and for the moment, it's not even part of the information bubble or the de democratic discourse. The second part, once again, is we need know-how. We need to really sort of you know, go about um, recovering a mining industry which is effective, which um, is compliant very quickly with a lot of different standards in Europe and in the, in the US. And if we want to do it in a way that somehow decouples from China, even relatively, we have to do it together. And I recall during the Trump era, the moment when President Trump wanted to buy Greenland, which is very resource endowed, we're facing in Europe the worry of an unstable ally, and we're not quite sure how long we're gonna be able to call it an ally. So even for us, we don't quite know what type of industrial ecosystem it creates in Europe and, and abroad, or in terms of alliances. And yet this is what would facilitate and accelerate essentially this new industrial revolution of some kind. Um, material substitution and recycling, these are really strong uh, sort of core tenets of the Green Deal and of the way that the European actors are looking essentially at um, the way in which we can do a transition towards a mineral industry. The problem is that um, there is only so much material substitution that you can do. So Finnish actors, for example, in the battery space said, well, we really don't want to go and extract cobalt in the DRC because this is very sort of sensitive in terms of human rights and extraction and things like this. So we're gonna try and increase the level of nickel, for example, in terms of our battery composition, which means that we switch dependency from the DRC to Indonesia. And Indonesia is in and of itself an ally of some sort, also a bit unstable, also very close to China. So there are many different things that we need to think about. In terms of recycling, very quick answer on this. The OECD, the Joint Research Center of Europe and the World Bank all estimates that we need at least another 15 years of primary extraction before we can reach a circularity of economy which is full, which is closed. So there's no way around it, we need to mine. 
and uh, we need to sort of understand what we mine for. And this is the next challenge for Europe. At the end of the day, we cannot sustain an energy intensivity, which is what we have today. We have to change economic modeling, and everybody is getting very, very polarized about this at the moment, you know, like degrowth and post-economic modeling and things like this. I'm very agnostic about this. What I know is that essentially the way in which we do carbon accounting in Europe is unfortunately partially wrong, because we outsource a lot of our emissions outside of Europe, and that if you look in terms of accounting at resource and material footprint, we usually use about 2.5 planets per year. For the US, it's about four planets per year. That's way beyond what we can sustain. So we're gonna have to change the way in which we do economic metabolism. We just don't know what's next in terms of modeling and how it relates essentially to international relations. And how do we, if I may sort of rephrase your question, if I understood it correctly, the legal frameworks that currently tie certain actors to deposits can we undo them? Can we change them? This all depends on um, national jurisdiction. So for example, Fair Mining and Stork, which own three different permits in Madagascar for chromite mining. If you look into the details of the contract, there are certain things that if they don't honor them, then the contract is, a, is void. It's annulled, essentially. And there are every likelihood that um, these sort of Wagner-associated companies may uh, not be able to comply legally with a lot of, dif of the different mining you know, components of the, of, the, of the contract. So the more we become nimble at understanding essentially how to support um, national jurisdictions within Africa, Latin America, et cetera, in terms of the reform of mining codes, and there are many reforms going on in the world, is precisely on this because these countries have understood that these minerals are very much in demand and that we need to move towards um, a better appreciation market-wise of these commodities and how to play on competition. The more we're going to be able to sustain also a way in which, at least I hope, Europe can potentially place itself um, on a historical trend where it helps to build governance systems that make sure that the mining sector actually contributes to development, which has not has been historically the case, that the mining sector can contribute to adaptation and in mitigation of their, you know, sort of impacts, and that therefore there is a very strong industrial proposition in Europe and potentially in the US, Japan, Australia, to say we need to decarbonize, but we're gonna do it in a way that is about co-industrialization, co-benefits of economic value, and that finally we may have a proper conversation about how to redistribute global welfare in a fair manner, because otherwise countries that are at the heart of the scramble for resources will say, you don't want us to use gas when you do, when you, you know, respond to the war in Ukraine? Well, too bad for you. We're going to play our own cards, and they're going to be against you. That's why there needs to be this sort of mindset change in Europe saying our future depends on partnerships and alliances that are actually strong value propositions rather than self-interested only. Julian. Um, <coughs> um, I'm afraid that would be much less inspirational than that. Um, <laughs> Uh, first of all, I, I don't worry so much. I mean, we, if we look at the markets, for instance, now is the hype of the sort of the crisis narrative, uh, but not in the uh, market concern. I mean, we uh, we were expecting a month ago the gas to go through the roof and to continue. It reached almost 350 euros on TTF. And then at the moment, at that moment, uh, Putin started tightening the supplies to Europe, expecting that the next day probably it will go to 400 or 500. At the moment, he started tightening further the supplies of, of gas to Europe. The market price of gas started going down. I was looking now, it went down and down. Today, it went down 9%, further 9%. It's 175 um, euros at the moment. And 
uh, there was a question about the, um, the market cap. I mean, the market cap, I, don't, I personally don't know, can't imagine how that would work, but the market cap for uh, Russian gas, for gas, was set at 200 euros. Well, I mean, the market did the job. I mean, it's under 200 euros, so there is no point putting this market cap. It would just kind of disrupt the, 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 the market signals. And I think that, that uh, you should interfere with the markets when they don't work. If they don't work, why, why should you fix something that works? Um, so uh, it, it is similar the case with the with the rare metals, by the way, with metals in general. I mean, lithium went straight up in the skies, but since almost the beginning of this year, the the, the, the lithium price is flat, and while demand for uh, and 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 market for electric cars has been very very. Uh, active and, and growing rapidly in Europe, at least, but in China, massively. Um, uh, I wouldn't go into speculation why exactly the, the, the price of lithium is not going further up, but uh, uh, I think part of the, uh, the, this growth was uh, speculative and, and, and uh, uh, very extreme concern that, I don't know, the word is is coming to an end, but it's not coming to an end. The same thing is with, with copper, with cobalt. I mean, the, the prices are flat or going down. I mean, they, they went down. People, uh, people who were betting in the last six months on, on metals lost a lot of money, actually. Uh, so it's, we, we, we should look at, into that a little bit kind of more um, calmly. The same thing about uh, food. I mean, if we if we think about, we, we tend to think that we have a um, we, we are expanding our agriculture to an unmanageable level. But what we see, the data shows that the agricultural land is slightly shrinking in the last uh, in, uh, ten years, but production is going up simply because agriculture is becoming more productive. So this. Um, uh, balance between productivity and more advanced uh, uh, production and, uh, and, and then also some more measured and better managed uh, uh, demand uh, will, will probably lead us to uh, out of tragedy and out of disaster and we will live in a crisis that is normal because crisis is part of, of, the, of life. The, the, the the, the point about the, the aggregated demand, um, I mean, I wasn't referring to the total aggregated demand. When I was speaking about uh, resource efficiency, um, I, I, I mean just things that are related to energy use, because the, there was a clear uh, sign that there is a shortage of energy, and we're becoming too dependent on a single source, and that disaster could happen, uh, so we should have been prepared for that. Uh, where I don't agree with the Commission is this idea of let's reduce gas demand by 15%. We should say energy in general, because energy sources are interdependent. They are not completely inter uh, replaceable. You can't replace coal with gas one-to-one, -one. Uh, but when you reduce gas demand, you increase through complex chain, you increase uh, illegal logging, for instance, for uh, firewood. Uh, so if you, if you focus, for instance, on efficiency and uh, domestic stoves that work on, on uh, wood, uh, you affect also the whole energy market and that tampers a little bit the also the, 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 the gas demand. That, that was my, my point. And uh, uh, again, on the windfall profit, uh, yes, they have to be addressed somehow, but uh, um, again, I would fa favor pushing the windfall profits through incentives back into efficiency and renewables. Because these are the companies that know how to invest in, in energy. And there is a risk that the government will take all the money, that's happening in Bulgaria, take all the money 
and give them to everybody and take home more money and give them to everybody in a system that favors richer people because if you start suppressing the, the, the energy price, you basically subsidize this energy price and you subsidize, you give more subsidies to people who use more energy. So if you have two swimming pools and, and, and five CUVs, you get much more subsidies than somebody who is struggling to pay the bill for one light bulb. But the problem in Europe is that we don't have a good system for uh, definition of addressing of energy poverty. Energy poverty is a very, very complex phenomenon. And you can't just say, oh, there is energy poverty, let's put price of electricity 20% down. It doesn't work. Or let's give to everybody who doesn't have enough money some money. Yes, but some people live in very small house, other people live in big house, some houses are very well insulated, other are not. So this is a very complex system. This is not developed and that has to be developed in order to put this excessive profits or other public funds to target people who really need it and not people who uh, will just uh, benefit uh, uh, simply because they are, they are more bigger users. And the other thing is we, we see now gas demand in Europe has declined significantly because of uh, high prices. I mean, the price signals are important for, for increasing energy efficiency. Uh, so we, we have to keep them somehow in some form without damaging and, and, and punishing uh, people who can't afford to pay their bills. And about the five measures of the Commission, uh, too late, too little, and not all completely relevant. Some are interesting. I mean, the windfall, the windfall tax, it's a proposition from the... Uh, commission, they, it's very difficult for them to impose it. It's something that national government should do. But national governments are already doing that. Almost all national government, the British government was not doing it. Now Liz Truss decided to do it in the most radical po possible way. Um, so most governments are doing that redistribution and uh, using windfall taxes or some other mechanisms to compensate uh, um, the, um, the, the high prices. Uh, and I'm very much in support of demand, uh, the, the, the measures related to the demand side, but they are too late. I mean, you, you need something. So you need some time to change windows, to change stuff, to increase energy efficiency. And I'm not very much in favor of, of making people suffer with low temperatures. So, better do something so that we use energy in more efficient way rather than uh, say, okay, live in at 12 degrees. And, and there is an interesting point about the peak demand in this. I mean, peak demand is something that we can address with digitalization and with uh, intelligence, including artificial intelligence. Uh, and we can increase, address with many things. Uh, I mean, these light bulbs, if we change them, I mean, this light, well, they're on the whole day, but usually you have a peak demand because of lighting. I mean, part of the reason, the evening peak demand. If you change all the light bulbs in, 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 in Europe with uh, LED light bulbs, which are uh, paid back in, in one or two years, probably with these prices in six, six months, you will get, you will soften this peak, uh, uh, peak, uh, consumption significantly everything because uh, LED lights are 10 times more efficient than, than the very old ones. So, I mean, uh, so it's a mix back the, the, the European um, approach. It reminds me very much of the early days of the European reaction to COVID, which was a disaster. Thank you. Uh, join me, please, in thanking both Olivia and Julia. Thank you all very much for coming. I will spare you my concluding remarks.
that is for over lunch or coffee or wherever else we're going uh, this afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, our co-organizers, Concordia, Esther Stiftung, Fium, Mirjana Tomic, who's there sitting at the back, and Professor Stiglitz once again for his keynote and for sticking with us uh, for this really wealthy discussion that we had from both panels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan, and from Cardiff.